Hey everyone, it's Chris Castro again. This is the second part of the humility discussion that I started last time. As you'll recall, uh, if you haven't listened to the last podcast, please go back and listen to it. I'm reading through some papers that I wrote over the last couple of months for my seminary classes. And as I mentioned in the first podcast, uh, it's not that I want to be a pastor. It's that I really feel like the Lord is leading me to gain an educational knowledge and really dig in and understand what it means to be pastoral and to develop a pastoral mindset. And so we're talking about humility. And the paper that I'm reading is from my spiritual formations and discipleship class. And I read through half the paper and today is the second half. And so just to do a quick recap, I started out with an introduction. Uh, I discussed Murray's similar use of Jesus's teaching style and I discussed pride and all of that was done in the first episode. So part two is going to talk about holiness, about faith and some personal applications and a conclusion. And this is all because I had to read a book by Andrew Murray called Humility, which was an amazing book and I would encourage you to read it. And so we're gonna pick up with holiness and keep going on my paper. So feel free uh, to write comments down, to put questions down. And if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, Otherwise, we'll just keep going. So today we're talking about holiness. And so the English Standard Version or ESV translation of the Bible contains 611 references of the word holy. From Genesis to Revelation, God declares himself holy, and the biblical narrative is designed as a living guideline for his people to become holy through a relationship with him. This is especially apparent in the book of Leviticus, which contains many instructions for a lifestyle of holiness to honor the covenant the Israelites made with God, which required them to be holy. Leviticus 11.45 says, and this is from the ESV, for I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Now, Murray dedicates an entire chapter to holiness, and that's chapter seven in his book, Humility. The same theme is also weaved throughout the book. He begins in chapter one by suggesting that anyone who professes to be a Christian that pursues holiness, and I quote, ought to have humility as the chief mark of their uprightness, end of quote. This concept is mentioned in more detail in chapter eight, when Murray shares that humility shows itself as holiness through the display displacement of self by the enthronement of God, allowing the self disappear so God becomes all. In chapter seven, Murray discloses that humility is the thing humans need to be a vessel for God's holiness to shine through them, an evidence that is shown in how humble humans are in their interactions with others. Like Murray, Ruthven has a hard regard for holiness. And if you listen to podcast number one, you'll see that I referenced John Ruthven in a book that he wrote. Ruthven believes that developing a life of holiness is characterized by biblical morality and ethics, a lifestyle of repentance from evil and purity of heart, speech and mind is all essential. A lifestyle of holiness exhibits tangible fruit or lack thereof as evidence of holiness which allows a person to be effectively used by God within his kingdom. Yom Kippur is a traditional Jewish holiday designed by God as an annual opportunity to get right with him through repentance and cleansing of sins. 
The preparation days leading up to and the all day celebration of Yom Kippur returns his people to the holy state they used to experience in the garden. As more believers learn to implement the practice of regular holiness inventory checks, it's what I call it anyway, they will find humility easier to attain. Faith. Similar to holiness, Murray dedicates an entire meditation to faith, which is chapter nine. And then he employs the concept in many other places. Since Jesus's humility was the foundation for his journey to the cross, which delivered everyone from sin, Murray uses chapter one to state his case that humans need to emulate a similar level of humility. Otherwise, there is no path to produce faith. Later in chapter three, Murray identifies that the root of all faith begins by humbly acknowledging everything a human has comes from the Lord. Then in chapter nine, Murray pairs faith and humility as two sides of one coin. At its root, Murray says, faith is the confession of nothingness and helplessness, the surrender and the waiting to let God work. And he also says, humility is simply the disposition which prepares the soul for living on trust. Now, Ruthven exo echoes Murray's faith theme when he shares that the process of faith in scripture is hearing God's voice, which leads to an experience of his power and authority against the opposition of the enemy on earth. Faith is a common sermon theme across all denominations. Pastors often refer to Hebrews chapter 11 as the faith chapter because it is a long list of biblical heroes that are praised for being faithful to trust the Lord within their individual circumstances. In alignment with Hebrew, Hebrews 11, both Murray and Ruthven encourage others to step out in faith as a standard of living so they can exhibit the mighty works of the Lord through their situations. Then with each experience, it will be easier and easier to walk by faith rather than by sight, trusting the Lord in all things. Now, this is the personal application of my paper. The subject of humility has been close to my heart over the last eight years due to a challenging situation I've been walking through with the Lord in my personal life. Before that challenging situation began, I thought I was living a life of humility. It was when I was crushed and broken much later that I realized I had not even come close to the humility required to honorably state my position in Christ. Only through surrender was I able to climb out of the dark pit I had dug, dug during my painful circumstances. Part of my breakthrough was when I recognized I had put too much emphasis on seeing God as my daddy and friend. I didn't really recognize the importance of his position as king in all my circumstances. That mindset shift to equally value both daddy and king was essential in overcoming my anger at God for allowing that unjust circumstance to go on for so long along with shifting to the appropriate humility to trust his purpose for leaving me there in that circumstance rather than rescuing me. Much later, after I worked through my emotional healing and recovery journey, I finally understood his decision. Today, because of that, I reap both spiritual and emotional benefits from surviving that experience, which I never would have gained if I had escaped it. So I'm truly thankful now for the emotional pain I endured then and would not change a thing. Because of that season of brokenness, I've gained a new insight for why Jesus chose to walk with the humility of holiness through the suffering and persecution he experienced just before his crucifixion. And this is detailed in Matthew 27, Mark 15, Luke 23, and John 19. Without that level of humility, 
Jesus would have never been able to endure the emotional and physical pain, along with all of the abuse afflicted on him for hours before he was nailed to the cross. His holiness of humility kept him focused on the prize of God's restoration plan rather than the trauma of his current circumstances. Only by the grace of God are we able to do the same when interacting with difficult people or challenging circumstances. Now, I want you to hear this, and I'm digressing from, I'm diverting from my paper. You can overcome trauma when you abide in the Lord. It may seem really difficult. It may seem unbearable because you know what? When I was going through it, it felt unbearable to me. But on the other side of it, I learned that if I had understood and truly believed in God's sovereignty, over every situation in my life, I would have been able to get through that circumstance with a better attitude, with a better and more capable emotional ability to walk through it. But at that time, I didn't. And I was a mess of brokenness. And if you want to hear that story, go to my blog and click on that story. Uh, If you can't find it, it's begintoshift.com. Chris, K-R-I-S, dash, story. So let me get back to my paper. So Murray's themes of pride, holiness, and faith were called other personal applications as well. One specific example is when Murray shared the story of the Pharisee and the publican praying in the temple, which brought to mind the metaphor, what we feed grows. And that's the metaphor that I thought about. As I've grown with the Lord, I recognize that we all have a publican and Pharisee fighting for control within us. Now I do my best to feed the publican inside me through the thankfulness habits, as well as recognizing Jesus as my Lord and source for everything. I do my best to starve the Pharisee within me. Anytime I find myself leaning too heavily on my own understanding or my own abilities in a situation, as well as my own thoughts about the situation, because God's thoughts are so much higher than ours. And if we surrender our thoughts and actions to him and we submit to his sovereignty, we can get through anything, no matter how traumatic and how difficult it is. So today I try to reside within a one day at a time lifestyle. Day by day, I humbly thank the Lord for my daily bread and do my best to destroy all pride in my life through dying to self while activating excuse me, while active, actively cultivating a humility of holiness and faith. I'll never be perfect, nor do I want to be, because that would just be, um, ugh, I can't Im- imagine being perfect. But I have coming to a place of deeper surrender and trust that all things are really possible through Jesus. All right, and so now the conclusion of my paper says this. Paul's quote in Philippians 121 sums up Murray's book well. And he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And that's from the ESV, the English Standard Version. Dying to one's flesh through meekness and loneliness of heart, avoiding pride at all costs, serving without measure, and manifesting love with ease, 
These things need to be a person's greatest treasures. In addition to learning how to adopt all aspects of humility that Murray mentioned throughout his short but powerful book. Through that process, we realize this, the reward for humility is fear of the Lord, wealth, honor, and life. And I got that from Proverbs 22, four. English Standard Version. And so to end this podcast, I bless you in the name of Jesus. I absolutely bless you. God wants so much to bless you. And if you can learn humility, you will find that blessings will begin to show up because humility in front of God is how we get them. And we can have a longer discussion around that if you want. So thank you for spending some time with me as I read my paper on humility. And I'm looking forward to sharing my next paper with you next time. Have a fantastic rest of your week. And I look forward to everything that we share together in this podcast series. If you need to get a hold of me, Go to begin to shift. That's two with a T-O dot com. And I look forward to uh, chatting with you soon.